Thank you. That's a double blessing for me. I got to hear it in the first service, and I got to hear it in this service, too. Uh, you definitely got some talent in this church. I think it's been a really long time since I've been in any church where they had special music, where someone actually got up and uh, shared from the talent that God had blessed them with, what we would call you know, a special song or special music nowadays. You know, it's this praise band or the choir or whatever, but you never get that one or two people that uh, you know, like to stand up and bless the church with what God has blessed them with. So uh, glad I could be a part of that this morning. I got my cell phone up here. I'm not expecting a call or anything, but I want to make sure I uh, finish on time. So I'll use that to kind of uh, gauge where we are in the service. So we'll be in Galatians chapter 6 uh, this morning, thinking about the cross and the title of the message. Actually, I've got several titles of this message. I'll give you a couple of them that I kind of like to throw around. One of them is Glory in the Cross. Another title that I've used is Boast in the Cross. And another title I've used, and probably my favorite, is, is a sing singular ambition. And we'll talk a little bit about what uh, these mean here in just a few moments as we work uh, through the text. But Paul, of course, wrote uh, the letter to the Galatian believers. Uh, we know from Acts chapter 13 and 14 that Paul founded at least four churches uh, in the southern part of Galatia. City in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Uh, that Paul, on his first missionary journey, was able to establish those churches there. We know that uh, he probably established those churches before the Jerusalem Council that we actually read about in chapter 2 of Acts in verse 5. Uh, we know that it was on his first missionary journey. And we know that the reason he wrote Galatians was to counter some false teaching that was taking place there in the churches in Galatia, primarily uh, that in order to be saved, not only did you need to believe in Jesus, but you also needed to keep the law. And we call those group of people who were uh, teaching that false teaching there Judaizers. They were there stirring up trouble and, and again, telling the people, it's okay if you want to believe in Jesus, but you also have to keep the law of Moses in order to be acceptable to God. And so Paul, who preached salvation alone by grace alone through faith alone and christ alone writes this letter to galatia in his own hand by the way most of the time when he wrote letters he would use a secretary to write it down but paul felt so strongly about this that he wrote it himself without the assistance of a secretary or someone who took the dictation from him and so he writes to galatia to deal with that false teaching and that false teaching was undermining the central New Testament doctrine of justification by faith. Now, doctrine simply means teaching. So anytime we talk about the doctrine of salvation, for example, we're talking about the, the whole body of teaching within the scripture that deals with salvation. And so when we talk about justification, the big word I used just a moment ago, that's how we're, that's how we're made right in the eyes of God. And so another way of saying that is God simply declares you and me to be no longer guilty. Apart from Christ, we stand guilty before God. Uh, the only way that we can stand before God uh, without being judged for our sins is we, is we have to stand there uh, in Christ. That is, we have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so when God gives us the righteousness of Christ, he declares us to be no longer guilty. The word for that is justification. That's how God uh, does that. And so uh, you have these group of Judaizers saying, if you want to be justified, believe in Christ, keep the law. But Paul says, no, if you want to be justified, believe in Christ, who he is and what he has accomplished for you on the through his life and on the cross and by way of his resurrection, of course. And so, so Paul is writing to deal uh, with all of that and to, sim to simply defend justification by faith alone. If you want to be in a right relationship with Christ, or with, with, with God the Father, you have to do it on his terms, and his terms is faith alone in Christ alone, the work that Christ has done for us. And so Paul is writing uh, to the believers in Galatia to deal with that. 
And we get all the way over in the last chapter here as he's wrapping things up. He says in verse 14, but may it never be. Some translations will say God forbid. So in the Greek text, what he's really saying is, is, is he's saying as strongly as he knows how to say, you know, God forbid, or may it never be, and notice what he says, that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And so uh, some translations uh, will say that, that may it never be that I would glory uh, in anything other than the cross of Christ. Uh, here it is translated boast. Uh, it pretty much means the same thing. And, and if you know, for example, back in Romans, Paul writing about salvation and how God accomplishes salvation, he says because of all that God has done and because of uh, salvation through faith alone and Christ alone, there's no room for boasting. Well, here he is a couple of letters la later saying boast. So how do we reconcile those two things? Well, there's bad boasting and there's good boasting. And so back in Romans, when he's talking about boasting, he's talking about bad boasting, where uh, we might say something like, you know, look at all I've done for Jesus. You know, Jesus is just so lucky to have me uh, as part of his church. I mean, I've just done so much for him. I've, I've served on mission trips. I've served on various church committees. I've been a deacon. I, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, just list it off. You know, boast, 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 boast for all that you've done for Jesus. Well, that's bad boasting. What we ought to boast in, Paul says, is what Jesus has done for us. And that is what uh, he says here in verse 14. May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So basically what Paul is saying is we need to have a singular ambition and that singular ambition needs to be the cross of Jesus Christ. It needs to be... Uh, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he, he, he just kind of unpacks that in this one uh, really very short verse in Galatians, what it means to boast in Jesus or to, to glory in the cross or to just give all of your praise and all of your worship to Jesus and to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit for all that God has done in the person of Jesus Christ. And so... I uh, just want to quickly move through it this morning and, and think about uh, what it means to glory in the cross, what it means to boast in the cross, what it means to have it as your singular ambition. And the first, first thing I want you to notice uh, this morning is that, that Paul wants our singular ambition to be the person of the cross. And so he names the person of the cross here. He says, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the person of the cross then is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he could have just said the cross of Jesus, but he goes out of his way here to say the Lord Jesus Christ. So what he's trying to do here really is, is you know, capture uh, all of who Jesus is uh, and wrapped up in his person and his work. And so he mentions here the Lord, that means master so jesus is our master so not only do we receive him as savior when we come to faith in christ but we're surrendering our life to him as lord so not only are we being forgiven of our sins but we're also coming under the lordship of jesus christ and so that's what paul is trying to capture here when he says the lord jesus is our master the person of the cross is our master he is our lord but he also says uh, that he is Jesus. The person of the cross is Jesus. And Jesus, of course, is that one mediator between God and man. So if you want to have access to God, you don't come through the offering plate on Sunday morning. You don't come through all your good works. You don't come through keeping the law. You come through Jesus. He's the one mediator. He's the, he's the gate. He's the door. Uh, the Bible uses all kinds of, of different ways of symbolizing who Jesus is. You know, Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he talks about the narrow gate that one must enter through and the narrow path uh, that one must follow. See, Jesus is all of these things. He is, the, he is the way that we gain access to God. So he's our mediator. But not only Jesus, 
but he describes him here as the Christ. He is the Lord Jesus Christ, and Christ means Messiah. And again, the one, the promised one that God uh, said all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, I think it's about verse 15, where we have the first prophecy of a coming Messiah, the one who would come to, to pay the sin debt of the world in full so that through him, through faith in him, we could be forgiven and receive the gift of eternal life. So if you're going to glory in anything, glory in the person of the cross. Now when Paul says here, uh, may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's not talking about, uh, you know, the two pieces of wood uh, that Jesus hung on so much as he is the person who hung there on that cross. So he is really concerned with the Lord Jesus Christ. So glory then in the person of the cross. The person of the cross is Jesus. Let your singular ambition in life be the person of the cross. And the person of the cross is the Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, notice uh, the purpose of the cross. So we want, we want our singular ambition to not only be the person of the cross, but the purpose of the cross. So glory in the purpose of the cross. And so uh, what is going on here, Paul, as he writes, speaking of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Think about what was going on uh, during that six hours one Friday, uh, some 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung there on that cross. Well, we know that uh, the love of God uh, really uh, is amplified in the cross. You know, we don't ever have to worry about whether or not God loves us. He's already demonstrated his love for us by sending Jesus to die for us. And every once in a while I'll talk to someone, maybe you've been guilty of this. You know, I, I just don't feel like God loves me. You know, I got all this stuff going on in my life. You know, if God really loved me, I wouldn't have all this stuff going on, you know. I just, I just, well, you know, there's your first mistake. You're feeling instead of believing. <laughs> you know, God says he loves you, and he loves you so much that he wanted to be in a right relationship with you, and the only way that that could happen is he had to basically do it himself by sending his son to die for you and me on the cross. And so, so God's love is fully amplified in the person of Jesus Christ as he hung there on that cross. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says that, that God has demonstrated his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he didn't wait for us to get it all cleaned up. He sent Jesus, Jesus died for us, and as far as you and I are concerned, all of our sins were future because we were still future to the cross. And so even, you know, considering all that, Jesus God in Christ proclaimed his love for you and me. Uh, but not only that, we see also another purpose of the cross was to fully satisfy the requirements of the law of God. And so uh, if you want to have access to God, you've got to be perfect. How many perfect people we have here today? Nobody's going to raise their hand? All right. Well, think about this. Theoretically speaking, hypothetically, I guess, hypothetically speaking, Anytime somebody says, me, says to me hypothetically, I always put my hand up and say, I don't deal in hypotheticals. But we're going to deal in a hypothetical this morning. Suppose, starting today, everybody in here, so myself included, suppose starting today, we could live a perfect life from now until Jesus comes or until we die. Well, so what? You still have a whole lifetime of sin up until today that you got to deal with. And it's not just the sins that you and I commit that have separated us from God, but it's the fact that because we're human, because we're in Adam, we are sinners by nature. So even that little baby you may be holding in your arms uh, is a sinner by nature because we are all sin, sinners according to the Bible. And so even if I could start living a perfect life today, that wouldn't make any difference with God because I have a whole lifetime of sin up to this point. Uh, that needs to be satisfied. And perfection is what God demands, and only Jesus lived a perfect life. Only Jesus fully satisfied the holy requirements of God's law. And only through faith in Jesus can I too satisfy God's requirements. Because you see what happens when you place your faith and your trust in Jesus is God takes your sin and places it onto Christ. 
and he takes the holiness and righteousness of Christ and he places it places it upon you or credits it to your account and so for that reason the law of God is satisfied in the person and work of Christ and not only that we also see the life of God personified in the Lord Jesus Christ if you want to know what God is like look at Jesus elsewhere Paul will write that Jesus Christ is our life so he's not just a part of our lives he is our life and so we want to make sure that we understand not only that we want to glory or boast in the person of the cross, but also the purpose of the cross and that the love of God and the law of God and the life of God was fully uh, satisfied in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because you see, Jesus is central. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus is the main character. Every word, every sentence, every statement in Scripture somehow, some way, all ties in and points to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the main thing. And if he's the main thing, then I want to make him the main thing in my life as well. He is, he is the central person of Scripture. But not only is he the central person of Scripture, not only is, the, not only is he the main person of the cross in whom we glory, not only do we glory in the purpose of the cross, but we also want to think about and make as our singular ambition the power of the cross because we see the power of God revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ. He says here, may it never be, God forbid, that I would boast in anything other than the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what he says, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And so Paul is basically saying because of the cross, because of who Jesus is, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, because I have been identified with Christ, I am in Christ, because of all that, Paul says, the world is as good as dead to me, and I am as good as dead to the world. Now, he's not talking about the people out there in the world, because we're supposed to be missionaries out there reaching the loss for Jesus, but what he is talking about is that world system. We have three enemies as believers today, those three enemies are the devil, the flesh, and the world system. And they are all working in concert to get us off track, to trip us up, to pull us away from God, to try to get us going down our own way. Uh, if you don't believe me, just turn on the news any given day, and, and, and you can just see what's going on with the world system. It's like there's some kind of supernatural, demonic, satanic force sometimes behind the scenes uh, that's just kind of moving and swaying people to to do certain things and to make certain decisions. And, and, and Paul says, all oh, that's as good as dead to me. The world system has nothing for me. This world system doesn't mean anything to me. I am, the world is dead to me and I am dead to the world all because of who Jesus Christ is, all because of what he accomplished in the cross. And, you know, we have the devil to deal with and the flesh. And, you know, sometimes when we sin, we may kind of tongue in cheek say, well, you know, the devil made me do it. Listen, because of the flesh, you and I can get in enough trouble on our own without the devil's help. <laughs> but don't worry. If we run out of trouble, he's there to give us a little more. But, you know, think about that. Your victory, because of the cross, your victory over sin and death is guaranteed. It is guaranteed. You don't even have to worry about it. It, it is guaranteed because of who Jesus Christ is and what he has accomplished. Paul had a singular ambition in life, and it was the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, if you don't believe me, I think you do, but if you don't, let me give you a few more scriptures uh, just kind of as we wrap things up. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, for example, in verse 18. Actually, I like verse 17 too. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would, be made, would not be made void. Verse 18, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so, so Paul is saying there his singular ambition is not only the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, but it's not only to boast in that, but to preach that. That's the message he preached the message of the crucified, risen Christ. Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, verse 2. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So uh, Paul 
was not coming uh, to try to impress anyone. He had one singular message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then down in, uh, let's see, chapter 15, uh, verse, this is still in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so Paul says this is primary. This is of first importance. Now there, there are a lot of doctrines that are revealed in the scriptures, you know, bodies of teaching. The doctrine of the church, for example, is a doctrine we find in the scriptures, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of sin. I mean, you just go on and on and on. These bodies of teaching we find in the scriptures, and they are all important. And we ought to be learning as much as we can about each one, and, and, and preachers should be proclaiming them. But there is one doctrine that rises to the top of the list in terms of importance, and that is the doctrine of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because if you think about it, if that one falls, all the rest of them fall. And so that's why Paul would say this is, this, is, this is of first importance, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, how important is it? It's so important that Paul says later in 1 Corinthians that if Christ hasn't even been raised, then we are of all men and women to be pitied. Because we believe that Jesus died and rose again. I read earlier this week, I mean, this just blew me away. Uh, the author of the book, can't remember the name of the book, and I just kind of skimmed parts of it, but he said, get my statistics right here, 60 to 90% of our young people who we send off to secular colleges and universities will walk away from the faith. They'll be so ridiculed and challenged in what they believe to the point that they'll walk away from the faith. Now, the book offered a little hope in saying that 30% of those will come back in their mid-30s. So, you know, 30, by the time you're 35, you, you know, some of those come back. Well, that's still sad because they've wasted 15 years of their life that they could have been investing in the kingdom of God and eternity. And then later the author said that the answer to that, he believed, was to help our young people settle in their mind and heart that Jesus died and rose again. Because if that doctrine is true, and so that there's plenty of evidence to show that Jesus died and rose again, that the claims of the Bible are true. If you can settle that in your mind and heart, Someone still may be able to challenge your faith. They, they may still ridicule you. But if you know that you know that you know that you know that Jesus died and rose again, and that because he died and rose again, one day you too, when you die, you will be raised one day when Jesus returns. If that is true, then nobody will be able to ultimately shake your faith. So I guess my point is, if you're not teaching young people that the resurrection is true and helping them to understand you know, that Jesus was who he claimed to be, that he died, that he rose again. Get busy, because when you send them off out into the world, there'll be plenty of folks out there that'll be ready to start chipping away uh, at their faith. But if they can settle in their mind and heart, Jesus died and rose again, uh, they'll be able uh, to, I believe, continue in the faith. And, you know, I don't like to talk about myself much uh, when I preach, but five years ago, I almost crossed over into glory. I spent about two weeks in the hospital, most of that in ICU, had major surgery, uh, but I can remember like on a Friday, and they were going to do the surgery on Monday if I was still around, you know, I thought about a lot, but the one thing that kept coming back to my mind was Jesus died and rose again, and because Jesus died and rose again, if I don't make it to Monday, or out of this hospital alive, one of these days, I too am going to be raised. That just, kept, that just kept in the forefront of my thinking. It's like nothing else mattered at that moment. You know, I was able to meditate upon that, and instead of praying for myself, I was able to spend my time praying for my son, who was five at the time, and my wife, and, you know, that God would take care of them, and 
bring my son to faith in Jesus. And, you know, God just got me through all that because Jesus died and rose again. That's how important uh, this doctrine is. That's how important the message of the cross is and that we should not glory in anything but the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I can remember back in 2018 being at the graveside of my dad who loved Jesus, but, you know, God took him home and, you know, thinking this is not the end. Even though we're putting his body in the ground, that body is still in Christ. And one of these days when Jesus comes, my dad's soul is coming with Jesus and that body is coming back up out of the ground. And, you know, it's a mystery to us how God's going to do all this, but he's going to do it. He's going to raise our Christian loved ones, glorify their bodies, give us a glorified body. You know, souls will be reunited with those bodies. Why? Because Jesus died and rose again. It always comes back to that. Because Jesus lives, we too will live. And here's the bottom line. In the military, we give you the bottom line up front, but I decided to wait till the end of that. Here's the bottom line. I'm used to walking. Let me get back over behind this mic. Here's the bottom line. If you don't know Jesus, you have no hope whatsoever. So my prayer is that before you walk out of this place today, you would place your faith and your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, receive his free gift of eternal life, and know from that point forward you belong to Jesus, and no matter what happens, because Jesus died and rose again, Jesus is going to take care of you, and one of these days you're going to see Jesus face to face, either through death or when Jesus comes. And when I look around at the world today, I think we all here today have a pretty good chance of seeing Jesus come in glory. So just keep your eyes on Jesus and don't let anybody shake you from the truth that Jesus died and rose again. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. Father, we, just, we thank you for everything. And Lord, as we think about who Jesus is, the perfect life he lived, the death he died that we could never die, because if we died, we would be dying in our sins. But because Jesus died, he was able to pay our sin debt in full so that through faith in him, we could be forgiven and we could be saved. Father, we pray this morning for anyone who is here who is not saved. Father, don't let them walk out of this place today without doing business with you. Father, they can simply turn to you in faith and express to you their desire uh, to believe on Jesus and to receive his free gift of eternal life. There's no fancy words they need to pray or say for that matter. They just simply need to believe. And Father, you promised in your word that all those who call upon the name of Jesus in faith, believing that he is who he claimed to be and that he died for them and that he was raised from the dead. Father, your word says they'll be saved. And we thank you so much, and we'll be careful to give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.